Welcome, everyone. I'm Lou Burkholz. I'm here with my colleague, Marin. Um, we're going to start each session with a short framing of how we think about this topic. Uh, we're going to try to do the same framing every time. I think it's a good way to kind of transition and connect and just ground yourself in this 20-minute this opportunity here. The caring adult relationship serves as the most protective factor in a child's resilience. Uh, this vital connection is something that we all have the power to nurture and harness. It's the greatest skill set that we can develop, and it doesn't require equipment, facilities, or curriculum. And though we can't always see the impact of love, we have to believe it matters. Each vital connection that we will explore is not just a young person's want, we think of it as a need. Wants imply something that you can maybe more easily say no to. A need is like water, you have to have it. Without it, you won't survive. And when we meet a young person's need, we do something vital for them. We hope this series can serve as a moment for you to pause, to reflect, to feel the power of this amazing element of your work uh, and in the care for the young people that might be on their professional side, but also in your personal life as well. And to return with a little extra energy, excitement, and a couple more tools in your toolbox. For each session, we'll share one story, talk briefly about how this particular vital connection ties into resilience and then make sure we allocate kind of most, most of about half of the time to share some of our favorite practical and what we think of as really exciting ways to forge this particular vital connection. We'll look at six of them over the series. So one of the earliest organizations that we worked with at Edgework and that I had the, the real privilege to work with about 20 years ago was a company called Grassroots Soccer. And they're a company that uses the power of sport to educate young people around the world. We helped write their first curriculum around HIV prevention in the early 2000s. And one of the original coaches that I got to meet with and work with um, in Zimbabwe was named Quinji. Quinji was on the women's national soccer team. She played professionally. She coached at the national level. And she was also one of the most seasoned and well-regarded coaches in grassroots soccer's entire network. And what made her really famous actually within the organization was that she had this knack of helping at a much higher volume, more young women to get access to services and support or outside of the program itself than any other coach. And grassroots soccer is a really interesting intervention in that it's relatively short in duration. It's sometimes sort of eight to 12, eight to 16 hours total spread out across a number of sessions. In one of my conversations with Quinji, I asked her about this frequency of referrals that she was making for girls who were being neglected, there were pregnancies, abuse, getting access to HIV testing, and how she was uncovering all these needs in such a short and really busy intervention. She wasn't sure. Her first answer was that the girls just came to her to talk. But as we talked further, I uncovered something really amazing. Quinji would always stick around after the session. She would wind down. These sessions would usually run in a soccer field or sort of some outdoor play space. She would kick the ball, dribble a little bit. You know, she was a, still a, a very skilled soccer player and she wanted to play. But what happened is that one or two of these participants, the girls, would, they would linger after the program. And she would inevitably invite them to kick the ball. And they would, maybe tentatively at first. And over the course of several sessions, the same girl or girls would keep hanging out after the program. And they would kick the ball for a few minutes and then maybe get talking to each other. And then either Quinji would gently ask if there was something that one of them maybe wanted to ask or talk about, or that girl would just initiate the conversation. A story would unfold and Quinji would eventually figure out what was going on and make the right referral for that girl. And this is how it played out over and over and over. It never got more complex. It wasn't a sophisticated design or approach. And I think for Quinji, it wasn't even that conscious or intentional, it just happened. But it was this other time that created the right situation for these girls to connect. And ever since this conversation with Quinji, we've thought about time differently. And time is, it's pretty multi-dimensional. I mean, we think about time as, as 
the stuff we schedule for, right? It's calendarized. If we're a parent or caregiver, it's that thing that's on the calendar that's behind Lou right now. Or if we're a coach, it's the, the session planning that we do for those two hours we have those athletes or after school work or what we're doing during the program time or teacher even, it's the six to eight hours of, of classroom time that we're filling. And our lens is on that, this really kind of formal scheduled intentional time. But I think there's another story. There is this time that's of course, the formal time, the scheduled calendarized time, but this, there's also this time that they spend with you and you don't always recognize it or, or, or even value it the same way that a young person does that, that that time is the time that they spend with you around programming, near you even. Maybe there are no words even exchanged. And for a young person who maybe is struggling or is hurting, this time becomes equated to maybe time they don't spend with you. It could be how you stay in touch with people after program, out of school when they're not around you. But the reality is it's deep and complex and it's relative. It's not all created equal. Some time is good time. Quantity of time is great, but reality says that the quality, what we're doing really matters. Not just when the activities happen and that they get the lesson, but where we're seeing outcomes. I had um, a conversation with someone this last year and they were saying, bedtime is the worst time for me. This is a caregiver story. She said, I cannot get my child to sleep. It is making me tear my hair out. So I'm gonna make bedtime the most, the best that it can be for the next year. And she really, really held on to that because maybe this was the child's time that they needed. Maybe this was the time the child valued. And, and we want to really shift. It's a paradigm shift for us. It's their judgment of the time and the quality of the time that really determines the power that it holds. And we call this vital connection skill making time at the right time. Because the right time may be not during your lesson, not during your session or after school activity. It could be during mealtime or snack time. We got to think about this as time that's high leverage and high impact. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, time is costly. It might be our most costly resource out there right now over finances, over money to really have time. We're invested intentionally with the young people. And, and look, some people, some young people need time and need more of us than others. We can't equally dole it out because the reality is there's just going to be people in our programs, people in our lives, where the vital connection has to be made with the person that's struggling more, that needs more, more love, more lens towards them, more shift towards them. We're going to talk about this on our sixth skill, if you stay with us through this whole vital connections uh, journey, when we talk about commitment, but there is a fact that we don't give out time equally. And by the way, Maybe we have to even think about time on a different lens. We did the work down in Philadelphia with an organization called Legacy Tennis. And we were really talking about vital connections and time and, and, and really working. We thought we were making such an impact with these coaches and one coach stood up in the back and they said, listen, this is all great, but what do we do with the other 22 hours of the day when they're not here with us? And really when it comes to fostering resilience, maybe the best time we could spend in young people's lives is to spend an hour or two hours giving the people around the young person, giving them the skills and resources that they need, the caregivers, the teachers, the after school workers, the youth development people, the coaches, giving them the tools that they need to impact that child the most. Maybe one or two hours there actually equates to a hundred or thousand of hours with the young person in terms of its impact and in creating greater and deeper social fabric for them. So what can we do with time? We wanna take a really practical and kind of tactical approach. That's what we, I think, pride ourselves at Edgework on focusing on. And so I wanna offer you five of our, we'll call them our current favorites because they're having impact with maybe some of the young people in our lives or in the organizations we get to work with right now. The first one I think of is, we'll call it sort of time in seconds. I have a three-year-old, um, as of a week ago today, I also have a newborn. <laughs> um, and my three-year-old is intense in every possible way. 
and she's confronting also her own COVID challenges separate from her sort of nature, her intense nature. And as I've immersed myself in her world, and I, I've done youth, youth work for a long time, I, I prided myself on having direct service work with lots of kids every year. I, I work with one child right now until last week. Um, so my view is a little skewed, but as I immerse, immerse myself more and more in her world, I've uncovered is that there's a different way to process time with her. And she needs a different amount of time to get to the solution, the answer, the thinking um, that I often am able, willing to, to bring. And this is developmental, right? For someone of her age, it's, it's very much a, a thought process, but it's also tied to her stress response. And I see this more and more with her as she confronts her versions of stress. We know what happens when we get stressed. Our thinking narrows, we can't think as clearly. And what I've been doing for the last three or four months, and I wish I figured this out a year ago, is just counting to 10 after almost every question or request that I need to make of her. Not out loud, because um, I think that would stress her out, but just a slow, relaxed, silent count to 10. And it's been amazing for me uh, how often she gets there, wherever there is, before I get to 10. Not always, but much more often than I give her credit for, and much more often than the pace at which I want her to move through her day. It's her time. And she needs to move through her thinking, her decision-making, her stress response at a little bit of a different pace than I'm willing to. And what's amazing I find is that for me, that 10 second count becomes really calming. I don't think about what I'm gonna say next because I don't know what she's gonna say next. The silence becomes regulating for me. I really believe that not just for three-year-olds but for kids of all ages, one of the hardest things in working with young people is silence. And we sort of assume silence is delay tactics or it's just being belligerent or resistant. And, but actually there's a lot of thinking and feeling that goes on and creating little tiny windows of time can produce remarkable outcomes. And so I would encourage you to try it for an hour, for a day, for an activity period, for a meal, so much frustration is wrapped up in the conflicting speeds at which a child and an adult, a teenager and an adult move through their day. And so what if you could tilt time a little bit more in their favor? You have 10 seconds to spare, not always, but in my experience, and it's a qualitative example, um, it's more often than you think. So in addition to the time and seconds, this idea, this tool, you think about time and activities, and, and there's been such a move in the last, I don't know, 25 years, certainly it was a bit different when I was growing up, where we have these child centric, which I think are great, it is great to do child centric activities, but the child is the center, the child is leading, doing, directing all of the activity, but, but the reality is we've become, in some ways, disengaged from what's happening, one eye on the phone, one thought on work. What if we could do play, teach stuff where we're both engaged, where it's not just time for the child, but it's also time for you as well. And you're engaged. I, I think about this person who wanted to be bedtime as the best bedtime of the year. So, you know, it was so hard for her. It was such a pull, 30, 40 minutes stretching on. For those of you who have kids, I know you relate. I see, I see Lou nodding vigorously. She, she loved photography, this woman. She decided, you know what I'm going to do? We're going to do a bedtime palooza. My daughter's going to dress up. I'm going to dress up. We're going to have the best pajama party ever. And she decided to take pictures. She has 365 going to bed pictures of her and her daughter making bedtime the best time ever. And it was one of the best. Her child had told her it was the best holiday gift she had gotten that year was this book made up of all of these bedtime moments. And so the parent, the caregiver got into it on the same level as the child. My partner um, and I own an ice cream shop. It's really my partner shop. I work there part-time. But the reality is we, we hire a lot of high school kids. We hire a lot of college kids. 
and I have a lot of things to do. I have a lot of edge work things to do while I'm at the shop. And I have, I have shop things to do, inventory, things that take my time, my energy. But when I go out and I scoop ice cream with those teenagers, that is the time they value the most. The stories that I start to overhear, the ways they start to joke with me. They take pictures on my iPad, which links to my phone, which means my entire iPhoto on my computer is filled with them being silly with one another. I try and get them out of the shop after cleaning and they're lingering. There is this effect where this time is the time that they need. And it isn't always the time that I plan for. Time we think of as also a place and a young person's sense of time changes when the environment changes. It's become our, our deep conviction and it's really just I think part of the DNA of when we design programs for organizations now uh, especially in the trauma space, like that every program and every household should really try to identify a zone, right? Call it a common corner, a reset nook, a sensory space. Um, I think what all these things have in common is that they, the young people, and you know that you've got a place to go where strong feelings can have their, 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 their room, where recalibrating your brain and body is okay, where leaving an experience for the moment is not quitting, all together, it's just taking a break. I used to run the, uh, the gym at the Boy at Boys and Girls Club in Cleveland many, many years ago, and I can't even count how many times I sent kids out of the gym because there, I, didn't I didn't create a space inside for them to reset. And I must have wreaked havoc with the rest of the club, sending these kids that were not in control of themselves out of the gym because I didn't know what to do with them in the space that I was working in. So reclaim the space where there's control and choices and you can spark rhythm and reconnection and sometimes even co-regulation. It might be a corner of a room, a strip of space behind the bench in your gym or a blanket in a corner. And having that space we think of as part one, but I think what really makes it come alive is when you teach and talk about how to use it and then you get to use it yourself as well. We also have been thinking about time and transitions and breaks. And this, it, we've alluded to it earlier in this talk, it, it's that informal time. It's that space that fills time. These are unbelievable opportunities for the young people that come early to your program, for the, lung, the young people who stay late, who are lingering and around. It's amazing how much time and things can happen during that time period. As a, uh, 20 year college soccer coach. I learned a lot over that time span, but I would tell you it wasn't until the, my last 10 years of coaching that I realized how important plane, van and bus time was to really be unplugged, to, to potentially wander the aisle and see what's happening and let that time organically happen. There's also something lovely that happens when you're driving or walking together or sitting side by side, sharing meals. And that is you're not staring at one another. The threat level goes down, the opportunity just to flow with conversation or sit in silence as Lou spoke of earlier is much more opportunistic for you there. Are you really there? Are you really engaged? And can you not plan for it? Can you just say, I'm gonna be present in this moment, in this transition, in this break. These are some of the most important parts of time. And again, it's costly, but can you be there for it? So the last example I wanna share is we think of as time and requests. And so I would offer this as a challenge for everyone to think about with one or all of the young people that you get to spend time with and they're in your sort of caring circles. Pay attention to what, time, what type of time your young people want from you. As a thought experiment, imagine the dream minute, hour, or even day for that young person. What time, what kind of time do they want to spend with you? I know for my daughter, she is in this like immersive character type of play, mixing the stars of Frozen, Tangled, and Moana, and then these invented characters that have come to life in our bedtime stories. And she doesn't want five extra minutes before she goes to school, she doesn't want an extra kind of half hour here. She wants three to four hours of repetitive, immersive fantasy play. And I cannot do this every day, but when I deliver on it or over deliver on this request, uh, over time, I think what happens is that I feel like she sees me differently. 
not as a play partner, but as a trusted and understanding play partner. And as a conversation experiment, I would challenge you to take it a step further and just ask them, what's your dream minute? What's your dream meal, dream evening activity? We can guess and invent, and that is co-created, but even deeper is to ask them, what kind of time do they need to spend with you? And when you ask that, treat it, treat the exploration of that question as, as seriously as you would if you were searching for the symptoms behind a physical ailment. Approach the conversation with deep curiosity and humility. Don't assume you know the answer, even if you do. Count to 10 and listen. And once you know the answer, try to spend time with them doing what they need you to do. The relationship you forge with your children and young people revolves and evolves over time. It's, it's this profound resource that we have. There's never enough of it, yet there's so much more than we think. Time comes in all kinds of durations. It can occur in parts of the day that are wonderfully inconvenient to your schedule. Uh, and it shows up in forms that we wouldn't always choose. And just, I would say, remember our friend Quinji. Look for when the relationship happens and what types of need they have during that time. That's the biggest impact. We're gonna to aim to follow the same structure next week with a new topic. We're gonna to look at um, story next time. Same time next Tuesday. Thank you all very much. We will uh, open it up if anybody has any questions. I think the chat is open. We'd be happy to stick around for a few minutes and um, connect a little bit, and then we'll uh, sign off till next week. Thanks, man. That no was questions just yet, but uh, get, let's give everybody a minute. Yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll hang out. I do want to comment. Deborah has written in our Q&A. Um, I love this line that kids are not lazy. They are who they are. Uh, and and uh, it's so easy to label them as such, as lazy or not listening or um, disinterested. I think the, that idea of processing and slow processing and thinking really does matter. And sort of yeah. adopting that as understanding their behavior is telling you something. Someone said, can you share a few yeah. more answers as to what your dream minute is? It sounds so basic, right? But it, I think it a lot of it is being super present, um, which is really hard to do, especially if you do group work, um, which means you know phones away and distractions away and logistics away and things out of your hands and your version of what sort of the right kind of contextual eye contact and connecting is, whether it's taking a knee or sort of changing your angle or position. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with power and being willing to shift kind of the power to them. Um, like we know that, you know, I, I can't even think about how many times I have talked to my daughter looking down and realized like what she must feel when I'm talking to her with this sort of height dynamic and her head craned up here. And is it enough to take a knee at eye contact or should I be on the floor um, trying to look up, which, you know, doesn't always work in a lot of youth settings and could be kind of weird, but might be just the thing to kind of shift it a little bit. And so in that, that minute, I think that's a piece of it. When we get to the belief part, when we talk about the um, one of the vital on belief, we'll talk about I think some things that fit into that um, that minute frame as well. Sharon, I see your question about when you can't do the three-hour immersive, which is very hard to do. I will not pretend that I can pull that off more than I don't know what the frequency is. It's not enough. Um, I think it's then it's about the quality of the experience, right? Can can you decide? With the, with the child, like what's the right use of time? How much time do we have? And also I think there's a negotiation, obviously with certain ages you can't fully negotiate, but um, you know, would you rather play for five minutes here and five minutes there, or can we wait till tomorrow, till the next day and actually do something for half an hour or an hour and helping them appreciate how much valuable, what, what that time volume really means? And how do we mark it? Do we put a calendar up? Do we set a timer so they can see it's not yet, it's gonna be in two hours. What can we do in the meantime? I spend more time helping my daughter distract herself away from the things she wants until it's time to do it the way she wants to. Um, and, you know, an immersive activity once a week, once every other week, if it's framed correctly, I think can actually create a lot of 
anticipation energy. And we can talk about what we're going to do while we're in transition and, you know, weave things into other parts of our experience that might allow that to have its most impact possible as well. We have some we have questions both in chat and Q&A. So um, trying to sort of take these in order. Ben had written, what are some of your best examples of creating spaces and times for people to reset or process? Um, we use some in, in sort of the sports space examples, but wanted to know some other examples in normal family businesses or environments. I know Ben in some schools, um, you know, there there are there are rooms or places that that kids can go to to uh, whether they're sensory rooms or um, what we don't want to think of is the time out rooms. These should be staffed by people. It should be a place where there is another adult there, not necessarily to say what's going on with you right now. Um, so I know in schools they have that. They they I've, I've seen things like push against a wall, just uh, allowing to take it or, or to take a sip of water to really feel that. Is it cold? What does it taste like? So there are, there are different resetting things that people can use in moments. That's not necessarily a space, but sort of a momentary time piece. Um, I don't know, Lou, if you have an, other examples for businesses or some other places, maybe in family since you have two kids. Um, I was actually trying to read the other questions and stay ahead oh. of the me <laughs> and listening half to what you were saying, not to discount what you said. Um, let me just replay through here. Oh yeah, creating space and times. It's um, I think the big thing is as as for a, as an adult, as the adult in the room, whatever you think of yourself as compared to them, um, it doesn't have to happen in the moment. Like I think about how many times we need to leave something, come back to it an hour later, that night, the next day. There's this need to sort of like fix it with young people of like, okay, we got to solve this and let's process it and go over there when you're ready, come back. I may not be ready for three days. Um, and so I think it's really important to make notes of sort of when things weren't the way you wanted them to be or when somebody sort of struggled and then you wait, take your time. If you're building a relationship and you get to work with this young person over time, then time is actually on your side. And we know that sort of the right conversation at the right time is worth 20 other conversations. And having a little log in your phone of sort of the unresolved, unfinished uh, conversations, I think makes a huge difference to know when it, it's okay to revisit it. And in the meantime, maybe they'll bring it back to you when they're ready, which again is enabling and empowering and just such an incredible, I think, shift of the paradigm as well. I was looking at the question of sort of the line between manipulation and staying awake. I have been struggling with this throughout my career, not just with my three-year-old of like, when is someone doing this on purpose and trying to get something from me? And, and it's just, Yes, they might be. And what I've tried to do, it doesn't always work, is challenge myself and say like, okay, they're trying to get this. They're trying so hard that they're willing to risk the relationship. They're willing to kind of put a piece of the relationship on the line around trust and connection. Why do they need this so bad? What if it is a need and not a want? It doesn't always work for my mindset, but it does help. And I do think there's something about what would it look like if this, if I just went with them? I, I have a, 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 my daughter cannot go to sleep sometimes. Like they, we've had nights like three hours in the room, um, not crying, just sort of unable to sort of fall asleep, wants to play, wants to do this. And I've tried a couple of times to say, you know what? I can't force this. Let me just see where she takes this and let go of my time. I, I get it. I will be exhausted for the next day. And it's amazing. There's been a couple of times that I've seen her un go towards and uncover some of these things that she needs to really make her bedtime work and they become tools I can bring back as well. So I think it's, you know, you flip the paradigm and think, let me just see where they take this. You know, there, there's safety involved and you have to kind of think about your own time. But if you can let go of where you are for one opportunity and see where they go, I do think there's incredible things kind of behind the, the curtain that they may pull back when um, it's their led time and not time that sort of we're driving towards an agenda that we have, which again, my agenda most nights is sleep. So I can't promise that this is foolproof, but the paradigm shift for me when I get to do it has been game changing. I think we're probably at time for, uh, speaking of time, for, for q and I hope we got to most or all of the questions, uh, but we'll capture these and take a look. And if we can't get them this time, maybe we'll come in early 
as we always do for these sessions and they put a few answers in chat and be able to make sure that answers happen um, along the way, even if we can't get to all of them now. Thank you all for the opportunity. It's a great pleasure and really excited to, um, to see everyone next week.